<clears throat> Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us. Um, given the growing concerns about the rush to develop a vaccine as soon as possible under Operation Warp Speed, the American Medical Women's Association Sex and Gender Health Collaborative recognized this as a critical time and an ideal opportunity to elevate the issues of sex differences along with racial implications in assuring that the development of vaccines for COVID-19 are carried out and reported optimally. I'm Jody Godfrey, Deputy Director of the American Medical Women's Association, and we believe practitioners and the public, particularly women who typically drive healthcare decisions, deserve a heightened level of reassurance about the safety and efficacy of these forthcoming vaccines. To explore the role of sex and gender differences in vaccine development and production, we've brought together a panel of experts who will provide insights and maybe some, set some expectations for what is needed so we can be sure that COVID vaccines and treatments will be as effective for women as for men. So setting the stage for today's expert panel discussion, I welcome, I'm honored and have the pleasure of introducing our panel today. So I first welcome Dr. Sabra Klein. Dr. Klein is a recognized expert in the research on sex differences in, in immunity. She's an associate professor of molecular microbiology and immunology at Johns Hopkins where her research lab focuses on the mechanisms mediating how women and men differ in their immune response to viral infection and, vaccine and vaccination. Her team has found that women typically mount more robust immune responses than men and can be more beneficial for clearance of viruses and outcomes following vaccination, but also can be detrimental in causing immune, immunopathologies. And I'm sure she'll give us more insight on that today. Thank you, Dr. Klein, for joining us. Thank and you. And well, welcome the author of Stellar Medicine, Dr. Sarah Lynn Mark, an internationally recognized leader in women's health and precision innovation. She's AMWAS spokesperson on COVID-19 and public health, and she holds four faculty positions, including associate adjunct professor of medicine at both Yale and Georgetown. As founder and chief executive of Solamed Solutions, she served as medical and scientific policy advisor through four administrations and to NASA, the White House Office on Science and Technology Policy, as well as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation Investment Fund. She's also founder and president of iGiant, a nonprofit organization dedicated to accelerating the translation of research into sex-specific design elements for health practitioners, such as N95 masks that actually fit women's faces. And to offer perspective on treatment specific to women, Dr. Allison McGregor joins us. She's Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine at Warren Albert Medical School of Bra at Brown and author of the recently published Sex Matters, How Male-Centric Medicine Endangers Women's Health and What We Can Do About It. Dr. Marek Greger is the founder and director of the Division of Sex and Gender in Emergency Medicine at Brown University and a founding member of the AMWAS Sex and Gender Health Collaborative. And for today, our moderator is the esteemed Dr. Padmini Murthy. Uh, Dr. Murthy is Professor and Global Health Director at New York Medical College School of Health Sciences and Practice where she's been working to promote women's health and human rights, social determinants of health and diplomacy, and the promotion of global health for the past 30 years. Dr. Murthy serves as global health leader for the American Medical Women's Association and is chair elect of the International Health Section of the American Public Health Association. She's vice president of the Global NGO Executive Committee Department of Global Communications at the United Nations. We will take questions at the end so kindly indicate who the question should be directed to and put it into the Q&A or chat boxes. And now I should pass this off to you, Dr. Murthy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jody. And a welcome, everybody. First of all, I'd like to give a big shout out to our three uh, women. You know, hey, thank you for joining us. It's really great. It's not that we hate men, but unfortunately, we women are being left out of the loop for so many things. So what promises to be, I think, a really exciting, <clears throat> uh, you know, 45 to 15 minutes? Because one of the things is, as Jody has so beautifully set the stage for this, we need to, if you have any Q&A, or please post them in the Q&A box or even chat, and we'll get to that. So let's get going, ladies. Thank you so much. Appreciate your time. And thank you all of you for joining us. And, you know, this is what I want to say, that uh, it, it's, it's so strange that there, there is this rush, this push to get the vaccine out. 
And we all know that COVID has affected men and women differently. So in the quest for the holy grail, as I call it, the vaccine, will differences associated with sex and gender be included in any ongoing clinical trials to provide reassurance to us women and improve acceptance of these vaccines um, for COVID-19. So that is a big issue. So this is, you know, this is what I would like to start off by saying. And also we need to know what is the, what is going to be um, the impact of COVID-19? As we know, uh, there's a lot of issues which uh, Asian, Black, and Latino populations are facing. Mm -hmm. But what about the sex differences in women? So uh, please don't think I'm going to talk the whole time, but I just wanted to set the stage for this. So what mm -hmm. we're going to be discussing, and we're going to be looking at this from different um, views. So that's why we have three experts with us giving us uh, you know, their perspectives. And again, it's really an honor to do this uh, on behalf of AMWA and myself personally to have all these people. So to get the ball rolling, Dr. Sarah Lynn Mox, can you just uh, please tell the audience about a policy statement you, on gender and sex with regard to the COVID vaccine? Thank you so much. You are our media darling. So, you know, <laughs> the, the floor is yours. So over to you, Sarah. Great, thank you, Dr. Murthy. And I wanna thank the American Medical Women's Association for their leadership during this pandemic. It's really been extraordinary and I'm honored to be part of it. And I'm also honored to be part of a panel today with these stellar colleagues that you will hear from. It's truly a remarkable time in our history and we need leadership and I'm delighted to be part of this effort. Let's talk about, first of all, what we mean by sex and gender, Dr. Murthy. I'm gonna use the National Academy of Sciences definition and there are various definitions, but this is one that I've often adopted for some of the policies and programs that I've developed. We, when we look at gender, we're looking at the psychosocial construct. When we look at sex, it's more the biological construct. We know it's a lot more complicated, especially with the role of epigenetics. As we interact with the environment, the environment interacts with us and influences our genome. And I'm, I'm sure Dr. Klein will talk a bit more about that today. When we talk about policy, I think it's important just to have a historical perspective because you have to understand where we've been to know where we are today and where we need to go in the future. Often when we talked about women's health, it was really from what I would call a bikini medicine model, reproductive health, and maybe you could throw in breast tissue. Over many decades, we evolved into a more comprehensive, integrated perspective in women's health. I had the privilege to be the medical advisor for the Office of Women's Health at HHS, Health and Human Services, and we created National Centers of Excellence, of which Dr. McGregor was um, a leader at, at Brown. Um, and we really tried to take an interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary approach, realizing that we are a compendium of every part of our body. Every organ interacts with every organ. So I think we made significant strides, but as we've evolved into the world of sex and gender medicine, we realized we're moving more towards precision health and really trying to understand the differences between men and women. And, and I wanna be clear here, I really think it's important to take a non-binary approach. We often use the term man, woman, male, female, but really we need to be inclusive for everyone. We also need to look at the intersection of every human factor. As, as you mentioned, I work for NASA and we call those social determinants of health human factors. So we look at sex, gender, race, ethnicity, age, because all of that will play a significant role as we develop therapeutics and certainly as we develop a vaccine. I'm a geriatrician. And I know that my older patients often require a different dosage of medication of a vaccine compared to younger individuals. So I, I hope as we move forward that we will talk about these human factors, not as a means to discriminate or to determine who's better, faster, smarter, but just so that we can develop tailored medical care to meet the needs of everyone. Well, thank you so much, um, uh, Sarah Lynn, um, for that. I mean, uh, to get the ball rolling. And I just wanted to add one thing before I ask uh, Dr. Deborah Klein um, to, uh, sorry, Sabra Klein to join us, that one of the things I find is, this is in my work and I found that it's a human rights issue. Because a lot of times I think we are really sidelined because it's like, it doesn't matter. And you know, just to add, uh, uh, throw some uh, vinegar on the dressing to say that it's also gender stereotyping. I think that also goes into that. So um, now, Dr. Sabra Klein, Thank you so much for joining us. So what do you think, like, you know, you, you are really a, like doing the nuts and bolts of this because we are, the three of us are clinicians here, but you are a basic scientist. So mm -hmm. what do you think 
are the criteria to evaluate vaccines for any sex and gender differences. And uh, can you set the stage uh, by commenting on the known sex differences in immunity and the mm -hmm. immune response by women? Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Murthy. And, and thank you, Dr. Mark, for describing and, and separating sex and gender because I think that's so important and will, will contribute to my answer. Um, so as you know, we have uh, many vaccine candidates that are currently um, even in the midst of, of phase three trials. So, you know, tens of thousands of people being enrolled in each of these trials for various platforms. Um, here in the United States, we are primarily focused on um, what are referred to as adenovirus vectored vaccines. So using a virus to kind of get into our cells and generate the response that we will need against um, proteins that are on the surface of this virus, so SARS-CoV-2. But then we're also utilizing mRNA vaccine platforms um, that will um, get in again to our cells and alter cell machinery to alter the type of response. Why we're very um, focused, I think I would say, both in, and I would say we're focused on this in the Western world. So I do think that's important that Europe and the United States are, are very focused on these types of platforms right now. Um, we are interested in working with these platforms because they are gonna increase the breadth of the immune response. And so this starts to get at my answer to your question of what we know. For many vaccines, what we have often used are less sophisticated technologies for developing our vaccines, either developing um, some type of attenuated vaccine where we attenuate the pathogen, in this case a virus, um, and we give that attenuated form of, of the virus in order to, to generate a, a vaccine-induced response. The problem there, as we saw with the live polio vaccine, are concerns when that inactivation doesn't work well and, and people might actually get infected. So safety concerns, though very rare, are why you know we we're we're kind of going away from those types of platforms. The other platform, which we're seeing um, very popular actually in Asia, are inactivated vaccines. So that's like our flu vaccine that we all go and we get our our, our intramuscular flu shot. And those are easier vaccines to manufacture, and and we can we can manufacture them probably much uh, faster and on a larger scale than some of these newer platforms that we're testing for SARS-CoV-2. But the downside of these is that they're going to mount, they're going to cause us to generate predominantly an antibody response. And my lab and others have consistently shown that when we utilize antibody as the primary correlate for protection against a virus, it's women that consistently mount much greater immune responses than men. Um, and with some of these other platforms that increase the breadth of that immune response, where we're not as dependent on one arm of that immune response, that is where we often find that our male counterparts can do a bit better. The other place where we see some sex differences, and, and this is where it starts to um, intersect with gender, are in the adverse reactions that get reported. And I do think this is important because this starts to speak to patient concern about vaccines, about vaccine safety and, and acceptance of vaccines. I think as you're seeing all of these vaccine um, companies, they are signing a pledge to not make these vaccines available until they have determined that they are completely safe and they're not gonna be um, bullied or, or pushed to do anything sooner than, than is safely, they're safely capable of doing. So I, I, I think everybody in the vaccine world is very, very interested, concerned, and focused not only on the immunological efficacy, but on the safety of these vaccines. But I will tell you that even at mild and moderate levels, women tend to report more adverse reactions. And um, as Dr. Mark has, has often commented on, this is not just only for vaccines, this can be true for, for drugs as well. And, and I'm sure Dr. McGregor is gonna start to talk a bit more about drugs and drug treatments for COVID-19. 
But in terms of the vaccines, I think preparing women and female patients that if they are experiencing malaise, headache, possibly fever, that these are normal side effects. These are reactions that are being driven by that immune response and that are, are a part of your immune system mounting that response. It might make you not feel so well. It might make you even feel sick, but, but that is a part of that um, immune response that's greater, generally speaking, in women than in men. Thank you so much, Dr. Klein. That was so clear. I mean, you summed up such a complex, uh, uh, subject so well and I'm sure when uh, you know our medical students not only in the US but overseas listen to this Absolutely. and I'm definitely going to have my medical my students both the medical and the public health students like listen to this because I think you laid it out so well that's what I mean the nuts and bolts you said was so clear thank you so much and now um, uh, Dr. McGregor thank you first of all for your um, you know, efforts, I salute you as a woman, I salute the three of you, but especially in looking at this with regard to, you know, the sex differences, especially in the emergency room, because as we know, there's no one shoe which fits all. Um, so to take it away, as an ER specialist and doc, especially now you've been in the front lines of COVID and that's the beauty of this panel because we have people covering this. We have a multi-pronged approach here, uh, you know, our, our dear audience who are tuning in and listening to us because we are looking at all aspects of COVID. So um, Dr. McGregor, what have you seen about how uh, the coronavirus in women affects them when they come to the hospital? And how do you think this will play out in the future administration of the vaccine? Thank you so much for your comments. Thank you, Dr. Murthy. Um, it's wonderful to be on this uh, panel um, with you know, Dr. Mark and Dr. Klein. We have been collaborating on sex and gender differences for a decade. And I think what's really interesting that's happened with the COVID situation is it's really highlighted the fault lines in our healthcare system. It's stressed it out so much that we can really see where our problems are. And I think that's um, our opportunity to focus on sex and gender differences, um, especially because if men are having a greater mortality rates, they're having higher um, rates of severe illnesses. Um, what that's done is it's really declared sex and gender not just a woman's health issue. Um, and I think that that's really important for us to, um, to, to showcase for both men and women and, and science in general. So, so that being said, in the emergency department, we are seeing uh, the same trends that we see for all other health conditions. So women present earlier and uh, more often. Uh, men socioculturally are um, encouraged to hide fear and hide illnesses, so they wait longer to seek care. So when they actually do come in, they do have more severe illnesses. And so if we just take that for a moment and then think about the data that we're collecting, we are collecting data on severe illnesses, hospitalizations, uh, ICU admissions, intubations, and those are mostly men. So if we think about what's happening to women, I'll, I'll tell you what's happening. They are coming in and they're having milder symptoms and we ha don't have the ability to test everyone. So, you know, our hospital is constantly um, dealing with whether or not we have enough tests. Um, and that depends on where their surges are in the United States and when the testing kits are going to the places where it's needed most. Um, and so what happens is if you are not severely ill, um, we are um, telling patients to go home and self quarantine um, and giving them, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, advice of how to care for themselves and, uh, and, and then that's it. So they may not even get testing. And so what we're also seeing and what Dr. Klein alluded to is that women have more of a robust immune system. So 
So what's happening is that if they have a more indolent condition and um, they are responding to this virus in their system, they are um, more, um, so the CDC has quoted one third of non-hospitalized patients are more likely to have um, uh, symptoms greater than two weeks. And so that's the cohort of, of mostly women. And so these are women that um, are going to present to their physicians complaining of um, post-viral neurologic conditions that we know are very common. We see it with chronic fatigue and Guillain-Barre, and we're going to see it with COVID. And so if these long haulers, they're called, are going to be mostly women, they're not going to have the positive testing that is going to um, prove that they were had this illness. They're going to come back to the emergency department, seek care, and then be told that, um, that this is in their head. That, um, that they have a psychological reason for their physiological complaints. And, um, and this is just something that women uh, suffer from uh, you know, a, a lot. And this is my fear for women uh, once we um, get through kind of the severe part of the illness. And the other thing that we're seeing is that women are more susceptible to um, the, the, the stay at home um, uh, calls, okay? So the rules of staying at home. Women have more responsibilities in the home. They are, um, have responsibilities for their uh, children and the mental health of their children. And so the, um, there was a survey done in the US which showed that women, not men, women are having higher mental uh, stress and depression and anxiety um, because of COVID. And so what we are seeing are higher rates of interpartner violence. Um, they're getting more calls into the hotlines. We're getting more um, anxiety related uh, conditions. And so that is something that we're also um, dealing with as well. Thank you so much um, for explaining that and telling us what your experiences are and what you've seen. And just to add on uh, to what you said is that with regard to interpersonal violence, there is a, a report released by the United Nations um, uh, Population Fund. Uh, you know, I, I, was, uh, I did some work with them a couple of years ago and also with UN Women that for every three months of the COVID extending, the number of women suffering from IPV is going to increase by like this, like a couple of hundreds of thousands. And the other thing is a lack of access to contraception. It's not that we are deviating from the topic, but just because you mentioned that Dr. McGregor, and I wanted to say that, and you know, um, and uh, the other thing is, this is terrible in Argentina. There was a college professor who was only 46. And yesterday she just collapsed while doing a Zoom session in front of her students because of COVID. And she, and, uh, she might have got it from her husband who's a physician. So when you said that women in the US come earlier to seek uh, treatment, I have found talking to other colleagues overseas and in my own work and research that women are at the bottom of the totem pole in so many areas in the world. So this is really interesting to see this totally wide divergence with regard to you know, the COVID situation. But thank you again. So to continue the discussion, now we're getting really warm, warmed up. So this is really nice. And I hope our audience are enjoying it as much as we all are. Um, so Dr. Klein, um, I would like to know what in your view, could you please tell us, is the current state of the vaccine research? Okay, realistically, do you think we can get a vaccine out there by November? You know, we are not talking politics here before the D-Day or after the D-Day or what is really going on? Because I was talking to one of my colleagues earlier this morning and we said, and she said the same thing. And I told my daughter, it's like, Really, um, unless I know what there is, as you said, we don't have enough data. Where is the evidence base? Like, I don't think I'm comfortable putting this vaccine into my body. This is what I'm hearing from quite a few of my colleagues, you know, physicians, non-physicians. So um, would love to uh, listen to your thoughts on this, Dr. Klein. Thank you so much. 
Well, let me begin by saying that I got my husband enrolled in, in one of the trials and, and we are fairly certain um, from some of the responses that have been tracked and shared with him that he received the vaccine. So I think right there, um, and I will tell you, I love my husband. So um, the, the, I do believe in the safety as well as the efficacy of these vaccines. So I, I want to start there um, that you know, even if we can move quickly, and I do think warp speed may not have been, you know, the, the, the wisest phrasing for, um, for something for which we want to hear about the safety and precautions that are being taken. So I think that phrase tends to have um, baggage with it, an assumption that it's just, it's moving faster than the speed of light and without any real checks and balances in place. And, and what we're really talking about here are decades upon decades of research and, and knowledge about vaccines and how vaccines work and how to design vaccines against viruses. Um, so I, I, I have really, I have personally no fear about the safety and I think um, physicians um, should, you know, they are on the front line and should not, you know, be too swayed by maybe some of the more popular press types of um, articles that are available that, that in their attempt to give balance will raise maybe unnecessary or unjustified concerns. Um, again, you are talking about building on a, a framework that has been ongoing for really more than 50 years um, to develop these types of vaccines. So, um, so I don't have concerns about safety. Um, and, you know, I think what you're seeing with the early publication of data from both phase one and phase two clinical trials, you're, you're seeing a couple of things. You're seeing how readily these companies are willing to put their data out there. Um, you are seeing the rigor with which they are doing this, which has gone beyond what would be typically done for any of our more standard vaccines like the flu vaccine. Um, you're seeing them try multiple doses. They're collecting samples and diary entries from people at so many time points to really hone in on what is an optimal dose to induce the immunity needed, but not be so high that the side effects, you know, might be more than, than people want to handle. I think we need to be very prepared that um, because we are all immunologically naive, we have no prior immune history if we have not been infected yet with SARS-CoV-2, that this is going to require um, a boost. So you're not going to be talking about having to go and get one injection. You're probably talking about having to get two. And I think Dr. Mark, in her comments about older aged people, I mean, we're not even there yet for, you know, what she termed um, that, you know, precision medicine to better understand how dosaging um, based on age. So whether you're a child, an adult of reproductive ages, a pregnant woman, or an older aged individual, what those doses should be. I, we are not, we are not there yet. These you know, diverse individuals are being included in these trials, not children, but older aged individuals. And I'm not certain about um, pregnant women. Um, we may end up getting some good knowledge if somebody wasn't certain that they were pregnant. Um, that is at times through trials, how we learn things about um, flu vaccine trials um, and their safety in pregnant women was, was often through accidents. Um, but, um, you know, so I, I hope I've answered your question in that regard about safety. Thank you so much. I'm sure the reason I brought that up is because this was a conversation, you know, with everything know, going on and we I heard know. it from the expert. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Now, um, I have another uh, uh, question which came up, but I'm just going to turn over now to um, uh, Sarah Lynn. I'm sorry, I can't say Dr. Marks, you know, having known you for so long, you know, but... Okay, Dr. Mark. So 
how does, and then the same question I'm going to ask Dr. McGregor, because one of the things you just talked about the press articles, this is a perfect segue for this question is, how do you think both of you, of first I'll pass it on to you, Sarah Lynn, and then to you, Dr. McGregor, how does misinformation on COVID, I mean, there's so much, like we're, it, it's ridiculous. Like what I say is we are, are suffering um, from information itis. That means we're getting so much of information and some of it, it's really hard to kind of see through it. So how does misinformation about COVID impacting the public response to not only dealing with the pandemic, but also with the vaccines? Because we are on the threshold, as Dr. Klein just explained, and we are reading that this is like really important to see how can we do this? And as professionals, as experts, what is your elevator pitch message that we get across? Like, you know, like wear a mask, see? Something like that. I'm not saying that short, but how do you think you can make people uh, allay their fears? Just like Dr. Klein has very clearly, and then she said she has her husband in the trial, so she okay. gave it a personal story. So that's why now over to you, Dr. Mark, and then over to you, uh, Dr. McGregor. Thank you. Yeah, it's a, it's a very important question. And I've said from the beginning, messages have to be consistent with facts. They have to be coordinated among all messengers and they need to be cogent, just as you stated, keep it simple. I think the challenge that we've had is the messages have changed frequently and they often are delivered by different people who have different levels of perhaps trust or respect. So I think as we move towards the vaccine, towards therapeutics, we need to have the messengers who we truly trust. Those who are on the front lines developing it, those are the ones who are using it. Those are the ones who really believe in the science behind it. I think something that we have to look at is that when we make healthcare decisions, and, and I talk about it in my book, this plug for my book, Stellar Medicine, A Journey Through the Universe of Women's Health, is that healthcare decisions are not just made in isolation. You really have to understand the psychosocial and political environments which are shaping decisions. So I, I don't think it's by coincidence that we're saying by November 1, we're gonna have a vaccine. I mean, think about what we're up against right now. We have actually the perfect storm, a true trifecta. We have an election coming on November 3rd. We certainly are dealing with outbreaks uh, with COVID and influenza starting to reach our shores. And we also are dealing with environmental crisis. We have floods, we have hurricanes, we have fires. So people are afraid. And when people are afraid, they want to understand what is happening in their environment. They want to be able to control it and they want to do something to take an active role. So we have to be really careful here. We've got to be aware of the optics when we talk about November 1. I think if I were in health policy right now, I probably wouldn't put out that date because immediately into people's minds, they thought about what is the role of politics, which can override even what the science might be. And I think, you know, coming back to which you, you made your comment, we need to do a better job of explaining the scientific, this is a scientific process at work. We are basically all living in an extraordinary experiment right now. And we're all the research subjects. And it's a role we're not very comfortable having. And we need to have messages being delivered by people that we trust. And, you know, I hope as we talk a little later, we'll, we'll show that the role that women play, I mean, two thirds of every healthcare dollar are spent by women for their families and for themselves. And certainly, as we mentioned, as women are unemployed, they may lose their health insurance. We also have to talk about the economics of this. You know, will the vaccine be delivered in a way that everybody has access? As Dr. McGregor talked about, the racial inequities are significant. We're seeing, you know, the, the, the weakness, the cracks in our health system. Are we going to ensure that everybody has access, that the supply chain is robust? So all these issues need to be front and center, and they need to be transparent, and we need to bring the public along with us. Thank you so much. Now, Dr. McGregor, thank you for your insights. There's, there's, there's like, there's just so much to say. <laughs> I mean, really, it's just, um, uh, you know, I'm just going to um, uh, underscore some of the things that Dr. Mark said, but, um, you know, an elevator pitch, like this is our opportunity to discover sex differences in susceptibility and severity and therapeutics and vaccinations. And we're missing that opportunity. And I think that state and local and national 
uh, policymakers need to have some sort of language about this because the data that we are collecting, um, there isn't a universal policy that says you have to include sex or gender in the data of your of your of your COVID um, uh, po positive testing or severity. Um, so those people, both worldwide and um, um, you know the, the who and Global 5050, um, they're looking at this data, um, but they can only look at uh, data that was actually provided. Um, and so, um, so we're looking at trends, uh, you know, within that, but, but it's, there's no um, um, overall mandate to, 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 to bring this out. So I think that would be extremely helpful. And I think it would also be helpful like Dr. Klein said, we are not looking at whether these vaccines, um, if, if the dosing should be different based on these, uh, whether you're elderly or whether you're women, because if we're looking at the fact that it might be um, difficult to now have two vaccines for everybody in the world, and if we knew that maybe women only needed one or half a dose twice or you know something like that, we, we could have this um, available more, more widely. So it's things like that. It's things like having role models for men to wear masks. Um, we know that men do not wear masks as much as women. We know that men do not wash their hands as much as women. And when they do, they're less likely to use soap. So if we had some really masculine um, you know, role models for men to say that it's cool to wear a mask, like those are things that could really have important implications. Other things that I think are um, misinformation is when something like hydroxychloroquine, um, when that was really touted as the, um, the, the answer before research even showed that, um, what were people doing? Hoarding hydroxychloroquine. It happens all the time when something like that happens. Who takes hydroxychloroquine? Those who have malaria or those who have lupus. Who has lupus? Women. So now women were, were, you know, were losing access to this incredible medication that they've been on and sustaining on. And so it's those sorts of misinformation. And just while I have the floor, just a comment on pregnancy. Um, again, uh, you know, um, orphans in research, you know, we just don't research pregnant women at all. And one of the treatments that we're using in the emergency department and in hospitals and ICUs is um, having women or any patient um, face down. Um, if they're having problem oxygenating. So whether they're intubated or not intubated, we know that the prone position helps, helps open up lots of um, airways and, it's, and it allows a better oxygenation. So when you think about, I looked this up and the studies of proning were, were all, the diagrams are all physio, um, you know, anatomical anthropometric measurements of men. And so women have different bodies, different anatomy. We have breast tissue. And so I was looking at um, breast, you know, necrotic breast tissue that we're seeing um, because a lot of these things um, have not been designed for women's bodies, especially pregnant women. So um, proning is going to be very helpful to a pregnant woman because um, you're, you're off all of the, um, the aorta and, you know, the, the uterus can be very compressed. So these are things that we're just making up in the clinical arena and we're just creating towels and we're trying to figure, figure things out. Um, and so I think including, you know, women into these um, uh, research early on, um, let's not repeat the same uh, you know, history is repeating itself. Um, you know, women were not enrolled in cardiovascular trials and women, uh, sex-based data is not being done with COVID. And, you know, we're just going to see, um, uh, um, you know, uh, we're going to look back and, and, and perhaps regret this. Thank you so much. You brought up a very important point in the, not only the biological differences, but the anatomical differences, which yeah. can be a challenge. So now, um, Dr. Sabra, you're not off the hook as far as I'm concerned. So I would like to challenge you, uh, you know, because you are like right at the forefront of this uh, holy grail, as I like to term it. Uh, how, how would you, as an expert, as a scientist, urge the vaccine producers to include more data on sex 
differences. How can you, in your role, push this? Because Dr. McGregor has told us, and then Dr. Uh, Mark, I'm going to come back to you after uh, Dr. Klein finishes, because I want to uh, have your insights into policy because of your vast experience and how we can push this. So thank you again, Dr. McGregor. That was really very nicely uh, put. And now back to you, Dr. Klein. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Murthy. And I think, you know, I'm going to start off by saying that it's got to be policy change that Dr. Mark will be talking with us about. Um, I will tell you that for some, so it, at least in the United States, so this is not true around the world. And I know in some of the chat boxes, you know, we are talking about in some cases trials that are being run in other countries. So I will tell you that within the United States, it is required to have both men and women enrolled in vaccine trials. Um, this does not include pregnant women. Um, and I do think that is, a, is, is an important and different discussion about our, our kind of rights to make decisions um, if we would like to be included in trials, especially when we know that many of these vaccine platforms um, in general are safe. But, you know, that, that's, that may be a slightly different discussion. So I'm going to stick to the sex differences. So um, pertaining to differences between non-pregnant women and, and men. And you do have to include both men and women where many um, vaccine manufacturers, um, what they end up doing is enrolling both men and women and then not disaggregating and analyzing outcome data to compare whether the responses um, are, are equal, um, are equally protective um, in both men and women. I will tell you, I have been pleasantly surprised. There are some uh, that have published their phase two trials. And in the supplementary data were exploratory analyses um, comparing males and females. And, and early analyses really are reporting that women are mounting greater immune responses, at least in that 18 to 55 year age range. Um, and are also reporting more adverse reactions, though again, these are mild to moderate adverse reactions like headache, malaise, so that generic just not feeling well. Um, you know, so I think, I think where policy and, and where I'll drop this off so that Dr. Mark can comment comes into play is there are no requirements about disaggregating and analyzing data to compare males and females. And so all too often, the, um, the comments that get made are that studies, including phase two clinical trials, are not well powered enough to disaggregate and do analyses that a study was not designed to do. So I'm gonna leave it there. Thank you so much for telling us that and also for sharing the information about uh, how um, you know, the data is being reported in males and females from some countries, the prelim preliminary data. So now to you, um, Dr. Mark, yes. what do you think like, is important with regard to putting your policy hat now, not a physician hat for this moment to answer this question, please, but the policy hat on how and what you think is the succinct message you would like to get across, even though nobody listens to us health people nowadays. Thank you. <laughs> I should rephrase that. Very few people listen to us. Thank you. Thank you for that intro, Dr. Murthy. Again, I'm gonna go back to the past, the present, and the future. And just briefly, I wanna mention, we've talked about anthropometry. Uh, Dr. McGregor mentioned that men and women's bodies are different, and that's certainly key here in this role as well. Uh, I, I just want to briefly mention that in regard to personal protective equipment and then go into the issues of policy, uh, over 75% of our frontline workers are women and of those infected, 73% are women. And it's not just a numbers game. Partially it's because PPE does not fit women adequately. We, you know, we see it with our N95 respirators, we see it with our gloves, we see it with every aspect of our PPE that we need to wear to stay protected. So there needs to be policies put into place to ensure that it's not just the therapeutics that are being looked at, but also PPE as well, because that is our front, that's, that's our, 
our front line. This is our way to protect frontline workers as well as essential workers, as well as individuals who are home caring for their family members. So let's look back historically. We have the NIH uh, Revitalization Act, which was passed in 1993, that really mandated that we look at sex and gender as well as race in phase three clinical trials. Didn't need to be statistically significant. It needed to be enough for valid analysis so that you could see trend data. And that has played a very major role, I think, encouraging scientists to move forward and, and our agencies to adopt this policy. In around 2016, I believe, uh, preclinical studies as well as animal studies were now incorporating um, uh, sex and gender analysis um, because often, you know, it was too late down in the game when analysis was happening. So now if you can do it earlier, you get a better understanding of where you need to go. The Food and Drug uh, Safety Innovation Act, FIDESIA, was also passed, I believe it's section 907, that actually is encouraging industry to take a look at sex and gender and to disaggregate. It's not enough just to gather data, you need to look at it, you need to be able to analyze it. When it's pulled, it makes it extraordinarily difficult. I know, for example, at NASA, a lot of our sex gender data had been initially pulled and then making the effort after following NIH guidelines, we really were able to learn a great deal more. It's important that our companies really do this. You know, often there's pushback that there's not enough time, that it takes too much effort, that it's too expensive. And the answers to this is no. We're, we're dealing with life-threatening issues here. And as we mentioned earlier, if we find, for example, that women mount really robust responses, perhaps half the dosage or less dosage, which would make more of a vaccine available, as well as with other therapeutics. So I think going forward, we need to ensure that these policies are enforced it's not enough just to have a policy. You have to enforce it, so there has to be oversight. And then furthermore, we have to have our journal editors mandate that the data be described this way. It's not enough just to list a population. You need to really take the deeper dive and to understand male and female sex differences and gender differences so that you can apply policies as well as programs as well as products and protocols appropriately. Thank you so much. So what the three of you did, you gave us a three-dimensional puzzle, uh, you know, which really, and uh, not with pieces thrown away, but very neatly fitted together uh, so that people know what's going on, especially, um, you know, looking at it from not only the policy view, as you said, Sarah, but also uh, looking at the other differences, what we need to be aware of, Dr. McGregor, and you, Dr. Klein, when you talk about, you know, what the studies are and the challenges we are facing in the US. Now, um, I'm just going to tell you to please get ready for your closing statements. And I'm just going to ask you to think about what you would incorporate in your closing statements while I take a, a look at uh, our chat and the Q&A to take some questions. So this is for uh, the three of you uh, ladies. Can you suggest what are in your closing statement, what are some of the pros and cons for people to consider? Uh, and also, who would be the first to get the vaccine? So are we going to look at, you know, like who is going to get it? Who has the priority? I think this is a million dollar question, which is burning in everybody's mind. You didn't think I would let you get off so lightly. It's not that often I get to moderate and, uh, you know, a question and quiz three experts of your caliber. So, and I'm sure people would really look forward to listening to this because it's a lot on people's mind. So that being said, I'm just going to shift gears to look at some of our Q and A and, um, Okay, this question is, uh, what I have is, thank you for the stellar panel. Allow me to direct this question specifically to the, uh, Professor Klein. Thank you for your brilliant elaboration on the immunologic aspects of vaccine. Are there any efforts looking at the combination and interactions of influenza and COVID, and how could that potentiate the sex difference in side effects and our e efficacy? Thank you. Absolutely. So there is a very good chance that many of us, you know, will be getting both the flu vaccine and the, um, and the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine this year. Um, flu vaccines are already available. So my recommendation to all the panelists and to the patients that you may be seeing is encourage everyone 
to get the va the flu vaccine early. And I think it's, you know, I think it's important every year, but I think it's especially important this year because some of the symptoms that Dr. McGregor has described can be consistent with um, with influenza. And so the confusion about whether you're presenting with flu or you actually have COVID-19, I think is gonna become very important because I think it feeds into a comment that you made um, previously, you know, who, who's going to be getting the, the COVID-19 vaccine first? And, you know, I anticipate, though I don't know, that it's going to be our frontline healthcare workers, 70% of whom are, are women. Um, and um, I also think that elderly um, individuals may as well. And you're getting to listen to my dog roll around on the floor. So I'm going to mute myself. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Klein. And going on to our next question, which is uh, to all participants, and it was posted in our uh, chat box. So this question is like, is it likely that women with autoimmune disorders will have a different response or a greater response to the vaccine? Dr. McGregor, Dr. Mark. That's a terrific question. Um, I'm not sure that I, that we know the answer to that. Um, and I, I'm not sure I would, I, I, I don't know. I'm thinking that I'm not sure what the data is if women have mounted a greater response to the influenza vaccine. I don't know, Dr. Klein, you so, need Absolutely. So to date, we don't have data to suggest that women with autoimmune diseases mount mm -hmm. greater responses to um, an external stimulus like a vaccine. And there are um, a lot of data to date for flu vaccine, as Dr. McGregor pointed out. I think another thing to keep in mind, though, is that many of us, myself included, who suffer from autoimmune diseases are often immunosuppressed. So, uh, you know, and sometimes these can be broad immunosuppressants um, that, that can definitely, you know, actually even result in the opposite, you know, a slightly lowered uh, response to a stimulus like a vaccine. Thank you. Dr. Mark? Yeah, so I, I concur with all these comments as well. And I think what we have to look at, um, and this is something that I'll even throw back to Dr. Klein too, is that as people become reinfected, uh, what will their response be to the vaccine? What is the role of T-cell immunity, which was alluded to? And another area is antibody-dependent enhancement. You know, how, how important is it that we develop the right type of antibodies, such as neutralizing antibodies, the appropriate titer of antibody? Um, how will that play a role if we have to have uh, revaccination? So I think there's a lot of um, open, open questions here. Dr. Klein, what are your thoughts about ADE, antibody-dependent enhancement, especially with issues with people potentially being reinfected with the virus? Absolutely. So um, I think those of us working with these viruses and people who've been working with coronaviruses, including the initial SARS uh, coronavirus that caused SARS, as well as the virus that causes MERS, um, we really do not, for this family of viruses, um, we don't have a lot of concern about antibody dependent enhancement and, and the few bits of, of data that have come out have not been um, really all that convincing. I'll also point out that the use of convalescent plasma Mm -hmm. um, you know, while obviously has been politicized and is being debated, I will say that um, there is some evidence that it really is protecting and there's been zero evidence of antibody dependent enhancement um, in patients who have received convalescent plasma. Um, but I also appreciated your comment about T cell and T cell immunity. Mm -hmm. And I really wanna emphasize that, you know, these novel vaccine platforms, meaning, novel, meaning just not your standard inactivated vaccine that only induces antibody, they are going to induce T-cell responses. And recent data from infected uh, patients actually coming out of Yale showed that women tended to have um, greater T-cell uh, mediated immune responses, which again, you know, may suggest and, and play a role in that greater protection that Dr. McGregor was describing to us, including in the emergency room. 
Thank you. I have one last question here, which says that this is from somebody who's doing a study in Peru as a part of PhD and is investigating and comparing the role of behavior and immunity in women for COVID. And she says, men here said, if you discover something, we'll take care of that. What yeah. is the importance of that? That's a question. Could you repeat the question again, Dr. Murphy? Sure, sure. Uh, this is from uh, a PhD student from Peru who said her research is investigating and comparing the role of behavior and immunity in women for COVID. And according to her, but men here said, this is in direct quotes, if you discover something, will something will someone take care of that? What is the importance of that? I mean, uh, it's not clear. So I guess what she's trying to say, what uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is to find out if um, this um, person is written is in the. I'm going to just interrupt momentarily. They've written this is not a question. It's just an experience that they had pertaining oh, to probably sexism in the. Okay. So so maybe Sarah Lynn, maybe you know, just you know, Thanks. this notion about can, yeah. women are more often to be the ones studying sex and gender-based differences yeah. than our men. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's really interesting often. And I think for all of us here, when we've gone to lectures and topics on women's health or even sex, gender-based healthcare, we often find we're in a room of people who look exactly like us and it tends to be women. And what's interesting is that we know our male counterparts are taking part or are taking care of a female patient. So everyone really needs to understand what the issues are. And, and it comes back to, again, it's not, it doesn't need to be a competition about, you know, who's faster, better, smarter, or who's going to cope better. It's really being able to have all hands on deck so that everybody can take care of patients appropriately, that individuals can take care of themselves appropriately, and not to have this push pull because uh, every one of us on this planet is going to be impacted by COVID one way or another. And so we need to understand these sex gender differences, not to discriminate, but so that we can best take care of each other and ourselves. Thank you. Um, I think, yeah, that comment was maybe to some, something else somebody posted, but thank you so much. So each of you has one minute for your closing and then I turn it over to Jody. So thank you so much. It was really an honor uh, moderating this uh, panel and thank you for sharing your experience and expertise. Dr. Uh, McGregor, your one minute starts now. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much um, for having me on this panel. I think it's so important. The more we have these discussions, the more we can uh, make a difference. And to something that Sarah Mark said, um, you know, diversity is key. So we know that when women are part of the research groups, they're more likely to look at gender specific analysis. We know when women are part of uh, physicians and leadership, they're more likely to care for women patients better. So, so um, I think, you know, one of the things that I focused on for with my book, Sex Matters, is that we all have a role here. And since this is AMWA, most of us are either scientists or physicians. And so it's been said already, if you are peer reviewing something, make sure that it's included sex and gender. If you are the editor, please make sure that it's, a, if you're the researcher, if you are sitting on an IRB um, um, uh, board uh, reviewing studies, if you're into education of healthcare providers or scientists, make sure that this is part of the agenda. And if you're caring for patients, make sure that this is thought of. In my last, so Jody wanted me to make sure I held up my book and I'm also holding up Sarah Lynn Marks because I have <laughs> here, so in case you're wondering. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. Klein. So, you know, I, I echo everything that, that Dr. McGregor said. I think that was all very well said. I think the one thing that COVID-19 has done is has put sex and gender, gender squarely at the forefront and cannot be ignored anymore. And we can't ignore it in understanding the pathogenesis of infectious diseases and understanding treatments for infectious diseases. And that includes vaccines. And the fact that we are starting to see phase two trials broken down to compare males and females tells me um, that this is the case. We really didn't get into some of the racial and ethnic um, diversity um, and immunologically speaking, 
I don't think, you know, our immune systems are different. What can be different are the likelihood of having certain comorbidities, um, things like obesity that we know can actually negatively impact our, our immune systems. So I think lifestyle and, and, and gender associated factors come into play a bit more there. So I think regardless of your race, ethnicity, your sex, your gender, your age, the vaccines that are being tested are safe. And once they are made available to us, there should not be concerns about taking them. Thank you so much. Dr. Moore? Thank you. Well, I just also want to say it's been an honor to be on this panel with my esteemed colleagues. And I've learned a great deal, and I hope our audience has as well. I would say that we are in this together. We know divided we fall, united we stand. And as we're waiting for the holy grail of vaccines, there's a lot that we can do individually, such as wearing masks, social distancing, our own hand-washing basic measures that will keep us healthy, especially even during this time of flu. And I, I hope that we can learn from these experiences and take the politics out of it, that we all can help each other and we can help ourselves. In regard to your question about vaccine priorities, and I'm sure it's gonna evolve as the data evolves, we're so focused right now on mortality, but I'm also really focused on morbidity. We have, we believe over 6 million people infected. I think the number is significantly larger than that. And as we heard about the issue of long haulers and people who may have chronic COVID, this may be our younger audiences that may think they're asymptomatic right now, but we know COVID gets into the body and there are sex differences, but it also impacts everyone. So I would say that for my priorities, it would be those on the front lines, which certainly, as I mentioned, women are on the front lines at significant numbers, but also consider uh, vaccinating our younger populations. Um, they are the carriers to older populations. We also want to prevent chronic COVID or post-viral syndrome. And we also need to have this intergenerational approach. It's not because I come back to it at the beginning of our time. It's not who's better, faster, smarter. It's that we're all here on this planet and we need to work together. Thank you. Now I turn it over to you, uh, Jody, for your closing comments. Thank you so much. I just wanna thank you all because we're over time and I'm grateful because I think you've given the perfect kind of insights and, and the thinking and the challenges that we all have to face. and. As many of you have said, I, I hope this is the beginning of a long-term conversation that we can keep going to. So thank you all for your time. And I will give one last mention, if you didn't see it in the chat, please, if you're engaged in this conversation and wanna learn more, join the Sex and Gender Health Education Summit that begins on Friday and look in the chat for the uh, URL. And uh, I hope you'll join for at least part or all of it. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a good day, everybody. Hey, thank you. Uh, thank it's you. lovely seeing you. Yes.